Stand up for righteousness. Stand up for justice. Stand up for truth. I truly believe that thoughts are the greatest vehicle to change. We do not care whether the cat is black or white, as long as it can catch mice. We choose to go to the moon in this decade and do the other things, not because they are easy, but because they are hard. Victory in spite of all terror. Victory however long and hard the road may be. To those waiting with bated breath for that favorite media catchphrase, the U-turn, I have only one thing to say. You turn if you want to. The ladies not for turning. We've got to come together as one people. We are all Australians, regardless of your ethnic background, regardless of your political belief, regardless of your religious beliefs. We are all Australians, is a quote by Neville Bonner AO, an elder of the Jagara people who was the first Aboriginal Australian to be elected to the parliament by popular vote as a member of the Liberal Party. I thought this was an apt quote for our guest today, one of Australia's most distinguished and respected advocates for improving the standing of Aboriginal people across Australia. And on a personal level, having been asked by someone very special to examine these pertinent issues from a different perspective, I share with you some of my learnings from this frank and open discussion. Our guest today is Nungai Warren Mundine, AO, Director, Indigenous Forum at the Centre for Independent Studies. Born as one of 11 children in a poor family in regional New South Wales, Warren discusses relocating to suburban Sydney and attending the local Catholic school amidst the segregation of the 1950s. After leaving school early, Warren worked as a trolley boy by day and a barman by night. Warren speaks about his pride in completing his HSC through night school before moving to Adelaide to study at the South Australian Institute of Technology, now called the University of South Australia. Warren started his political career as an independent candidate for the city of Dubbo, where he was the first Aboriginal person to serve on the council. He ran as a candidate for the Labor Party in the 1999 New South Wales election and as a candidate for the Senate in the 2001 federal election. In 2006, Warren became president of the Labor Party and was the first Aboriginal Australian to serve as president of an Australian political party. Later, and after expressing his disillusionment with the direction of the Labor Party, Warren joined the Liberal Party and served as chairman of Tony Abbott's and Malcolm Turnbull's Prime Minister's Indigenous Advisory Council. Warren is chair of the Australian Indigenous Education Foundation and the Conservative Political Action Conference. Warren is also on the boards of several business groups, including Aura Energy, Fuse Minerals and Job Trail. Warren frequently appears in the media and has published two books. Hello and welcome to another episode of No Limitations, a show where we speak to elite world-class performing men and women and unlock the secrets and influences that have shaped their destinies and that you could apply to your own life. For our first-time listeners from all over the world, please don't forget to follow on your preferred podcast platform and share with your friends and colleagues. And for our listeners in Australia, South Africa and Canada, a big hello. I am your host, Greg Robinson, Managing Partner of Blandham Partners, board and executive search firm. In this inspiring discussion, Warren shares his vision for Australia and its Aboriginal people, characterised by unity, cohesion and optimism. Warren asserts his fundamental view that Australia remains the greatest nation on earth, free from the struggle against discrimination and institutionalised racism. A consistent theme in the conversation is Warren's belief in the importance of education and its unrivaled capacity to improve the standing of the disadvantaged whether Aboriginal or otherwise. In addition, Warren offers an appraisal of the voice and proposes some ways forward that can galvanise the country. Warren also covers a range of interesting topics, including his support for four-year federal parliamentary terms, nuclear power, and the defence of Israel. Lastly, Warren puts forward some advice about remaining true to your core principles, as well as the value of hard work and self-reliance. So sit back and enjoy Australian First. Warren, welcome to the show. I'm glad to be here. Thank you. Warren, easy question to start with. What is Australia to you? Australia is the greatest nation on earth. As an Aboriginal 
person and also with Irish ancestry through my great grandfather who came out from Ireland on my mother's side. I'm so proud of this country. People say to me, what about the beginning of this nation? And I say, well, name me a nation in the world that didn't have a good beginning. They all had the revolutions, invasions, yep. colonization, whatever. Yep. What I rate a nation on is how it overcome those things. And when I look at Australia, especially since post-Second World War, we have built an incredible nation. Uh, we got rid of all the uh, discrimination laws in this country. I was born in the 1950s under the uh, uh, racial segregation laws of the New South Wales Aboriginal Protection Act. Yep. Uh, that's all gone since 69. Uh, all the race laws have all gone by the 70s. Uh, we got full voting rights through the Menzies government in 1962, and our citizenship is no longer second-class citizenship since 1969. We got rid of that. Plus, we brought millions of, of migrants here and people who were escaping from the Second World War, from all the horrors of that, and people from all over Europe and Asia and We've been able to bring people together and build an incredible multicultural, multiracial, multi-faith, even atheist, everyone. We've brought them all together to make this incredible liberal democracy with all the freedoms and everything that we have. And people are all treated equal. You think we value it enough? No, I don't. And this is a sad thing in the last few years. I, I see the Australia Day this past year. Yeah where there was such an argument about it. But what made me proud was the blowback on it. Previously, people were saying, look, we don't want to celebrate Australia Day because of what happened and everything like that. Yep. But if it changed the date. So I said, okay, let's, so I become a change the date person and okay. we can all celebrate together. But this last one gave me a clear message. And that is that these people who want to not celebrate on Australia Day do not want to celebrate any day. And the Evidence of that is when you look at some of the festivals and everything they celebrate, great that we do. We, we celebrate our multiculturalism. But when it comes to Australian stuff, nothing. So now I'm not about changing the date because I will not celebrate on any day. It's about celebrating this great nation that we have here today and celebrating this journey that we're on, which every year up until recently had been on a great journey for improving this nation. Look, I have arguments with some of my American friends who yep. reckon America, the good old USA, is yep. the greatest nation in the world. I say it's nothing compared to ours. We have built this incredible nation where people get on together. And also we have that crazy Aussie uh, sense L of humour. Larrickanism. Yeah, larrickism. Yep. We, we used to take, know, take, the, humor. Yeah, take the piss out of each other <laughs> and have a joke. Yep. I remember in the schoolyard when we had people coming over on boats and that to Australia, yeah. they could hardly speak English and their parents definitely couldn't speak English, but they invited us into their homes yeah. and we invited them into our homes. And we used to have little jokes. Maria, who's I've known since kindergarten, still mates today. And I'm godfather to some of his children. He's godfather to some of my children. Yeah. We meet every every time. And it's like a continuing conversation over 50 years. And, uh, you know, when we first met, he was calling me an abo. Yep. And he, I was calling him a wog. Yep. And now we're great mates. We had our punch-ups in the schoolyards and we went on and become great mates. It's really funny when we sit around our kids and grandkids sit there and go, oh, my God, the things that you say about each other. And you laugh. And I said, well, that's because we've been mates for so long. We can say things about each other. We can have fun about each other. And when you listen to some Americans, and especially who come out to Australia in the Second World War as soldiers and that, yep. they say, we love being in Australia because of that larrikinism, that fun, yep. that taking the piss out of each other, you know, and having a good old laugh. That's what builds us. Sadly, we're starting to lose some of that. You know, in your role, and you've met a lot of very key stakeholders in this country, who's driving the undercurrent? You know, at the end of the day, this country was built on people coming to this country, whether it was the indigenous people coming in here 50, 60 or 70,000 years ago, they came and walked here. Other people sailed in, so other people flew in. Yeah. But this country has been built. So what's with this agenda, do you think? I think they're just haters, and there, there could be many reasons for that. I suppose the, the left 
is becoming more powerful in Australia. You know, the federal government is very left-wing government, mm. probably the most left-wing government we've ever had, had in Australia because yeah. I was in the Labor Party originally. I, I could say that some of the old Labor people would be turning over in their grave in regard to some of the things they talk about. Hey, look, no matter what the politics were, where you're left or right, where you're Labor or Liberal or National Party or whatever, uh, one thing we all had together is that we served in wars together. Yep. We were strong believers in Australia. We loved Australia. Look at Hawkey and all them and, and look at all the, the prime ministers prior to that, John Howard and everything. And they all were very proud of this country and all very proud about the people here. I'm enormously proud of the Indigenous people. I'm enormously proud of the, of the periods that we went through, the colonisation. And then and then you look at the other migrant people who have come to this country. I'm proud that they chose to come here. And they come here because they knew the countries that they were coming from were worse off there. Yep. They were worse off there than they are here in Australia. Australia gave them so much opportunities and so much freedoms. So why did you take that very famous moral stand on The Voice? It certainly wasn't easy. Well, when you look at The Voice, what was it actually doing? Uh, I've known these people who are on the voice side and some of them work for me and we were, were mates and we're still mates today mm. but I couldn't see how they were going to improve people's lives so initially if people look back to 2014 when it all started I, I was on the fringe but still involved in it just seeing is this going to be the thing is this what the Ulleri statement yeah, the heart. Right. yeah but when the statement of the heart was completed I looked at it and said no this is a power grab yeah this is not going to improve Aboriginal people's lives at all, and it's not going to make our nation better. It's going to divide us, and it's going to separate us as people. And so that's when I changed and uh, started going against it. And when you look at it, the campaign, and that, they couldn't even answer the simplest question. Like you said, well, how is this structured? Yeah. When the Prime Minister and Minister Linda Burney went up to Alice Springs because of all the, the problems that were there, yep. uh, they said, well, if we had a voice, this wouldn't happen. And so then that begs the question, okay, tell us why, how? Mm. And they couldn't tell us. They sort of like, just trust us, nothing to see here. And so when you can't do that, you can't say it, then that's, you can't, you can't change your constitution. The constitution is the document, which is the basis for all our laws in Australia. Mm -hmm. So if you're going to change it, you're going to change it for a bloody good reason. And you're going to have to take people on that journey to change it. Well, they didn't do that. They didn't trust the Australian people. They didn't think that we should know all the ins and outs of how it should operate and how it should be done. Oh, we'll fix that after the referendum yeah, has gone through. No, and, and you yeah. couldn't expect people to trust them. Yeah. And then during the campaign, also then the racial attacks. You're a racist if you don't support this. So many racist attacks on myself, like I call me a sellout because, you know, you're an Aboriginal person, you should automatically support this. Well, I said, most Aboriginals I know don't support it. <laughs> and I said, so So where does that come from? Is most Aboriginal people racist and, and sellouts for their own people? No, they figured that, you know, if we're going to make a change and that we have to get kids to school, it's very simple stuff, get kids to school, uh, get them educated, get their parents into jobs, get an economic base for them to work from yeah. so they can buy their own homes. They can, like all Australians do, you know, my parents brought their own home post the Second World War after my dad come back from the Second World War. And, uh, and that improved our lives because a house is more than just somewhere to go to sleep at night. A house is, this is your own property. This is your own piece of yourself, your own safe little spot. I remember my mother, and I wrote about in my book, is that, uh, when the welfare board, the Aboriginal welfare board, which had permission, they could just walk into Aboriginal people's homes. When they walked into my parents' home, didn't even knock. My mother picked up a broom and chased them out with it. And when they jumped over the fence, they looked back and she said, this is my house. You only come in my house with my permission. And that's what happens to all people when they get to own their own house. It's their own little castle. It's their own little safe space for, for them and their children and everything like that. And so it has a lot more to do with not only material gain and, and assets, it also has a mental differences as well. Well, you're surprised, Warren, if you look at there's publications in a number of the uh, major newspapers of well-known business people, sporting people, et cetera, et cetera, putting their name out there in support of The Voice. And what, I guess, from my side of things, I was a little bit surprised, like you are saying, 
people are putting their name to a document when we never even saw the full document, never discussed the full contents of the document, never had a proper debate because all it was seen to be as personal attack, as you're saying, using the word racism. So there was an enormous wave of, I'm going to sign up. There's a sort of fervor at one stage to do it. So how did you overcome that? Oh, it was very simple. Our philosophy was that you trust the Australian people. Uh, you know, Australian people are not mugs. If you can't take them on a journey and, and get them on that narrative and, and seeing the future of getting a better future, then they're, they're not mugs. They're not going to buy it. And a good example of that was going back to the Hawke Keating years when we were paying so much high rates for our uh, for housing. Yeah. When I brought my first home, I was paying 18%. Same, yeah. People, when you look back, you say, you must be mad to do that. But what happened was that the reform agenda that the Hawke Keating government come forward with, they said, yeah. They sold it to us. They sold the narrative to us. They said, if, if we do this, and in the famous words of Paul Keating, the, you know, the recession we had to have, which yep. is painful, yep. but within a short period of time, things are going to get better and Australia is going to be competitive in the global marketplace. And guess what happened? Interest rates dropped down to 4%. Uh, everything got dropped in full employment housing, everything just went up. And within a few short years, we were competitive on the global marketplace. You know, we're a very small population in a large country at the bottom of the world. If I always say we're at the top, the, the Europeans are looking at it upside down, but we're, at, we punch above ourselves in the economic global marketplace yeah. on all levels, even in sport, look at the Olympic games medals and that. And w we do a tremendous job because of those reforms, but they were able to say, look, if we're going to make a change, it's going to be tough. And I can't guarantee everything's going to be perfect for everyone, but we guarantee the vast majority of Australians are going to pull through this and it's going to be the better for the nation. And they were able to do that. That sort of leadership, you know, that Hawke Keating leadership and narrative and, and the John Howard years as well, John Howard and, and Costello, that incredible leadership of, of trusting the Australian public as not being mugs and taking them on that narrative journey. Uh, we don't have that leadership anymore, unfortunately. So Warren, were you surprised by not just some of the, the key leaders in, in business, but the actual major corporates who put their name and actually not only just their name, a lot of money to the voice as opposed to what you were receiving? Uh, look, in some way, no. What's happened in the last, say, 20 years is this move in corporates and sporting bodies and so on who have, have moved into the political sphere. Yep. Uh, and that's through their HR and their directors of people and culture and all that. That's been the last 20 years. You know, when I first started working, you know, HR just made sure you, you know, you got your working hours done and, and they sorted out your pay and workers' comp and all that type of stuff. Now they, you know, they have campaigns and just about everything. Uh, so I wasn't surprised by that. What I was surprised about that the non-listening of them, they just come out and said, look, we, we support The Voice. And they didn't even know what The Voice was. Yeah. That There was no explanation with it. When you sat down and had a conversation with them and they said, this is a good thing. It, they sort of got the hype. It was, it was almost like this sort of, you go to the American football games where everyone's jumping up and down and singing or the, and carrying on and also European football games where you get all in this singing, hype yeah, yeah, and yeah. singing and dancing and all yeah. this type of stuff. And I got to say, I've never seen the, uh, I've you know been doing in the, uh, political campaigns for 35 years. I, I think this is the worst political campaign I've ever seen. Come out with the, the song with poor Johnny Farnham. Yeah. I feel sorry for him yep. uh, because he came out with that song. You're you're the voice. Uh, can you understand it? They didn't. Yeah. They didn't read that second part of the wording, and people said. No, we can't understand it. Please explain. Yeah. <laughs> and they could, if the corporates couldn't explain, no one could explain it. And and this is this is the problem we're having in Australia, this interference. Every football club, I had phone calls from rugby league players and AFL players and that saying to me, look, the AFL signed on to this, you know, yeah. the NRL signed on to this, but we don't support it. And, and they said, what should we do? And it gave me a great line from my mum and dad to tell them, which was my dad was a very strong Labor person. Yep. My mum was, you know, you know, you know, she usually picked on the policies and that what was happening. Yep. And I remember it when I was a young kid in uh, school uh, in 75 when Gough Whitlam was thrown out by the Governor General and then they had an election. Yeah, Cusco. Yeah, and it was, and they got flogged in that election. That's right. 
And uh, and my dad was sort of moaning and groaning in the lounge room, and we was trying to avoid him. And and Mum walked happened to walk through the lounge, and uh, he said he turned to her and he said, "I bet you you voted for the coalition." And she turned around really quick, smart, and said, "Well, you'll never know. It's a secret ballot." And my and so when people come and rung us like the rugby league players and other people, or people in in the large companies like BHP and and so on, Ramsey Foundation, that they said, we don't support this. I said, well, you know what you do? You just go to work, do your job, and when you go on polling day, it's a secret ballot, and you can vote whatever way you want. We didn't even tell them which way to vote, yes or no. We just said, you just vote whatever way you want. Warren, just being really straightforward here, just say did win, right? Do you actually understand how it was at all going to be implemented? Like, was it, because I, I went through it in depth, and I still couldn't figure out how it was actually going to be, because... Questions were never answered. They'd never answered the questions. And when you looked at the Calmar uh, Langton review, yep. w- w- what was going on, I did a five-part series for The Australian on it. it. It was this massive, huge bureaucracy. It was going to cost millions and millions of dollars to, to operate. And look, we've, th- we've been doing this since the Whitlam years, setting up committees with good intentions and that. My mother always said, the road to hell was paved with good intentions. And they all failed. And even even the Yes campaign said they failed. But then what did they do? They come up with another idea of a committee, which was going to be this massive regional and local and then federal uh, body, which is going to cost millions of dollars. You've got 25 people sitting around a table. They've got to get paid for that. Uh, they've got to fly around and get information. They've got to have researchers. They've got to have staffs. They've got to have officers. And then you start moving down the line and then you're running into probably hundreds of millions of dollars. And I'm sitting there, couldn't we better spend this? Like I was running at the time a Australian Indigenous Education Foundation. I was chair of it. We, we raised over $140 million uh, since 2008 to get Aboriginal kids in remote and tough areas of, of the large cities to school. Yep. We got over 1,500 kids through that program from year seven right through to postgraduate studies. So we had people becoming doctors, where they become lawyers, they've become engineers, they've become teachers and accountants and everything like that. They've worked, some of them work in senior banks now at high levels, some of them work in hospitals as surgeons and everything like that. And and that was $140 million we had. So I look at it, the money that they were going to spend every year on just a committee meeting, we could have used that money to get another 1,500 kids through. So what, Warren, what is a, um, and there's not, I'm sure there's not one solution here, but what is the broad solution? Because, you know, it's been going on since day dot. We've had, for years, we've been turning a blind eye. You've seen young kids badly hurt, right? That's why they're walking the streets at night. Yep. They're not going home. And we won't comment about that, but we know that's going on and you don't blame them. And they're going to be ruined for life. You've got remote communities sitting in the back of nowhere and we're sitting there saying, we're going to support them. How can we? Yeah. So well, what's got to seriously change here, Warren? Well, it's, it's a simple thing. Uh, when I was uh, approached, you know, after I left the Labor Party, I thought politics was all over. I got out of politics and back in the private sector. And then along come Tony Abbott and said, look, mate, I'll give you a job. And I said, I don't want a job in politics. I want to work in the private sector, we finally come up with this idea of the Prime Minister's Indigenous Advisory Council, which was a small group of people that come together, had business experiences as well as community experiences, and uh, and it was a focus on economic outcomes. Because, look, one of the biggest things that was missing from the uh, closing the gap statistics was yeah. economic prosperity. I don't know any race of people in the world, any religious group of people or any cultural group in the world of the history of the world, going back to when we first fell out of the tree yep. and started walking a wreck, without an economic outcome, which improved people's lives. And then from those economic outcomes, you had then medical stuff come out of that and you had a whole wide range yep. of other great things that happened. Yep. And so I said, just why isn't that in this closing the gap? So that's what we focused on. And so if you're going to set up the environment for economic prosperity, then you're going to have to have an educated and skilled workforce. So we've got to get kids to school. And we know that education is the golden key that opens the door for people to have opportunities to improve their life. It doesn't matter where you live in the world, education is the key to open that door. Yep. So we had to get kids to school. We had figures of, of less than 20% of kids attending school. Yep. 
in some of these communities. Yeah, but so, even if they attend the school, Warren, are they actually getting taught or are they going there that's the other to issue. get some sleep and get away from the harassment all night long? That's, that's the other thing. Then we said, okay, well, how do we work with the parents and the communities about this process? Yeah. And we also use our own experience. Like I used to do the night patrols in, uh, in, in Dubbo yeah, and okay. we used to see lots of kids on the streets and we'd collect them and at first, we used to take them home, but when we took them home, we we discovered why they were in the streets. They were, it was safer on the streets. It was, you know, some places we went to, it was like that movie Once for Warriors, where you went to the house and everyone's drinking uh, long neck bottles of alcohol and getting drunk and sexual abuse and fights and violence and all that type of stuff. Yep. And so, so what we did was we then worked with the local Catholic parish because they had a church hall that was vacant, and we said we'll fix it up and we'll help and we'll take the kids there and we set up pinball machines and we set up teachers to come in and help with their homework and things like that. That's where you got to start focusing on. And so we did education. Let's get kids through school, get them through university. One of the things that we, we avoided was ideological battles. So for instance, between public and private schools, oh, yeah. we said public and private schools are good. Doesn't matter what they are. We're not going to get into that silly battle. Oh no, you can't go to private schools or you can't go. And so we said, if the school's actually working, then let's get them to that school where it's working. And the first battle we had was with state and territory governments because they were in charge of education, yep. not the federal government. The federal government has the money and we had to try and use the money to get changes. And that, and that was a huge battle because we wanted to shift from aggregate attendance to, yep. to individual attendance because aggregate attendance, you know, you've got, you know, let's say, they say kids are at school, there's 90% of kids at school and that, that then when you look at the figures, uh, you know, they were that's yet that they were attending sometimes less than seventy percent, and we know from educationalists. I'm not an educationalist; I'm not going to pretend to be. They were yeah. telling us that if you don't attend schools at least eighty to ninety percent of the time, then you're not going to learn to read and write. You're not going to get do maths. You're not going to be able to do anything. So that was our target to get them there to eighty to ninety percent of the time. But we also needed individual information with the kids because if you've got a hundred kids at a community, fifty percent kids turn up Monday and 50 kids turn up on Tuesday, are they the same kids? Yeah, right. You don't know. And they said, well, we can't give that information to you. That's privacy thing. That's fine. We don't want their names or anything. You can call them student A, student B or student one or student two or something like that. But we'd need to know how many times they're attending school because then we can target their parents and their environment that they're in to deal with the issues of why they're not attending school. But if we don't have that information, we can't do that. Yep. And so we did that. We got that across the board. And then we empowered local Indigenous communities by going to the elders and saying, you grew up in a period of time in the 60s and that where you all attended schools and you went to the mission schools and everything like that. One of the strangest things uh, now with people, you know, always whinge and complain about the mission schools uh, the people who actually went there had a better education. This has been proven in every research paper that's ever been done, that they had a better education at the mission schools than they do today. And that was because they did the basic stuff about, you know, phonics and doing your maths and your maths times tables and doing your science and doing all these things and making it, especially when you're young, you need to take an applied science process so you're actually working with your hands and seeing things happening and being excited by it and they had a better education than their great grandkids today and that's just the damnation of the whole education system so we worked on that and what helped us a lot too we had a crazy minister for indigenous australians which was nigel scullion uh, because he, he used to take a hands-on approach you know you know look it takes months before linda burney went up to alice springs and and months later, before she went back, he, he used to ring me up and he'd say, Was, he'd call me Was, he'd go, you're the chair of this committee, so let's jump. I'm going to get a plane arranged. Let's fly up to Mika Farah in Western Australia in the middle of the desert. And I go, Okay, why? And he said, you'll, I'll tell you about it on the plane. So we fly up there, we get in and meet Kafara. And what the problem was, there's only about 18% of kids attending the school. So we went around, we went to the school, checked who was in that school with the elders, and then the elders and us went around knocking on the parents' doors and saying, hey, is Johnny here or Mary here or whatever? And they said, yeah. Then we had a conversation with the parents and, and the kids, and we got them to school. Now, that's a pretty hands-on crazy thing yeah, to do, yeah. the minister turning up and knocking on you. And then we also knocked on the shops and businesses in the town and said, look, can you do us a favour? 
don't serve kids at the milk bars or anything like that when school's on. Between the hours of, you know, nine o'clock to three o'clock or whatever the school hours yeah, were. Yep. And we got the shops for, uh, uh, you know, agree to that. And then one, I remember one time this one shop said, no, I can't do that. You know, this is one of the best times of the day with these kids not at school. And uh, so, you know, he said, okay, picked up the phone, his mobile phone, rung head office of that business and said, hey, mate, I've got a problem with your business here in Mika Farrow. And, and within about five minutes, the bloke got a phone call, the manager. He walked back out again and he said, look, I'm really sorry, but my boss has told me that we're not allowed to, <laughs> not allowed to serve these kids during school hours. So he was a crazy man and I loved it. You know, I, lo I loved his craziness because he, he actually got things done. Like when we did the land reform, that's the other thing we had to do. We have to do land reform because, you know, most Australians do not know that Aboriginal people cannot own their own house on Aboriginal land. It's collectively owned you know, collective arrangement and that. So what we said, well, look, you know, the first steps we know for 500 years now is uh, globally is that if you own your own home, that's your first assets that you can start building economic prosperity for yourself, your kids, your grandkids but and so that, on. But, but does that break with the, the cycle of the Aboriginal person or the traditional, the Aboriginal family? Well, that's what they were saying it yeah. does, but I, I don't believe it does because even now, you know, you look up in North East Arnhem Land with the Yungle people, we, we probably, they are the most still practitioners of their culture for 2,000 years ago, yep. and they are actually into the own, own ownership process. And, that, okay. and they're working, okay, that the Aboriginal land still is owned by the collective, yep. but they do do deals like the uh, they do in Canberra, because a lot of people don't know that Canberra is a 99-year lease. It's owned by the Crown. It's yep. got a 90. So they get a 99-year lease, and that's what happens. You sell 99-year leases, which is like it's just as good as uh, uh, private ownership yep. and they go from there. And so they're even into that and it hasn't affected their culture. In fact, they're very still strong about their culture. Mm -hmm. uh, it's except that people who want, because one of the things about Aboriginal culture is we don't, you know, traditionally we do not like slackers. When you're in the clan, you've got to bring something to the fire. Yep. I always, you know, you, ceremonial, yep. food, yep. all that stuff you've got to bring to the fire. And so we've forgotten that now. You know, one of the things that really hit me when I was in my mid-20s at university was the inquiry into the race riots up in, in Tumala, uh, was happened back in 88, yeah, 1988. We went up to that inquiry. I was just an assistant, you know, associate for the judge, uh, Justice Einfeld at the time, and he was doing the inquiry. Yeah. Uh, was at this community doing the hearings and that, and I was sort of standing there, got a bit bored, and I went for a walk around just to have an observation. I'm a great believer in, in leadership. What you should do is, you know, people talk about listening before you talk. Well, I talk about listening, observing, and then you talk. You have that conversation. So I'm walking around doing the observation walk, and I saw this house which uh, had a, a cracked pipe, a sewer pipe, and it was leaking sewer all down the backyard. So I walked up and knocked on the door, and the bloke opened the door, and I said to him, if you get a hessian bag in, we'll get a bit of cement, and we mix it up, and we could wrap it around that broken pipe. It'll hold that pipe for the next few months, which uh, gives you time to you know go in town and buy a section of pipe and then cut it out and put a new pipe in there. And he said, no, I'm not doing that. I said, why? And he said, because this is the government house. The government has to fix it. Okay. See, this is where policies, you, mm. know, you know, 10 years before, that Aboriginal bloke would have fixed it. Yeah, right. We have, you know, my parents did it. I've seen people in the 60s and Under 70s did it. So what we've done is we educated them now that this is a government problem, yep. not my problem. And yet they're the ones who are suffering. So we have to get that back to that self-sufficiency, self, you know, get off your bum and, and fix things. And I remember seeing my father, when I was young, he did, all, he made all the, the cupboards in our kitchen and he, anything broke or the, you know, the gr drains broke, he got the soldering iron out and fixed them and yeah. that. Now, these days you, you find communities, you know, the taps leak. You know, I heard this horror story in, out in the U Utopia in the Central Desert in Northern Territory where there was a leaking tap, which is very simple to fix in regard to you You just put, you know. You, you know change the washer. Change the washer. <laughs> they had to fly a bloke down from Darwin uh. to Alice Springs, get in the car, drive four miles out in the desert, and then replace that, that leaking tap, the washer, 
get back in the car, drive four hours back to Alice Springs and fly back to the, it was over a thousand dollars. That would have to be the world's most expensive washer in history to fix that. Well, I know from my life experiences where I've seen Aboriginal people just go, oh yeah, a leak and tap, I'll just change the washer. No, this is what we've done. We, we've taken away that self-sufficiency and taught them to depend on the government has to fix these things. As an Aboriginal man, bearing in mind we're seeing in Australia now the increase in Aboriginal population yeah. of people who are claiming, yeah. all right, if I was Aboriginal and someone claimed to be Aboriginal, I'd be disgusted if that's the case, if it's not true. Isn't that Wrong, or what do you think on that? Well, the problem, again, we've been hijacked by these elite groups. It's always been a discussion in the Aboriginal community about, well, who are these people who are turning up now? Yeah. Now, in some cases, not in all cases, there are some cases and people who had been taken adopted out and they've come back. Yeah, sure. But, but we all know those. Look, my dad used to sit there for five minutes, have a conversation with the person, then worked out who, who they were and the, or worked out, you know, whether they were Aboriginal or not very quickly. Okay, who's your mum? Who's your, and... The problem we're having now is this nonsense where, this is why I talk about we've got to stop treating everyone the same. Yeah. Well, I can identify now. Can I, can I warrant? Well, it's a self-identification now. People who voted in that 10% who voted in the South Australian voice vote, how do we know they were all Aboriginals? Because in South Australia, it's self-identification. So you could just walk up to the polling booth and say, look, I'm Aboriginal. And they, get, they don't challenge you. They go, okay, to vote. So it could have been even less Aboriginals voting in that poll. It, the thing is, when you go down that avenue, mm -hmm. then of course race becomes important. If we're going to provide services and opportunities for people, then you've got to prove you are of that race. Now, in the United States, I think it's one sixteenth in some Native American groups, Sioux and uh, Lakota and stuff like that. It's different in some places, probably one eighth or something. You've got to have, and you've got to actually have empirical evidence that you are. Yeah. Otherwise, you can't be part of the clan or the tribe. Mm. Well, in Australia, we haven't gone that far, but I, I'm a strong believer if, you, if you're going to come out and say you are, then you've got to prove it. Now, there is in the Native Title Services, I used to be CEO of the Native Title Services for nine years, when we do a Native Title claim, we have to prove that the people we're putting forward as that, say the Gumaroi in western, northwestern New South Wales, that they are actually Gumaroi descent. So we have to take imperial evidence to the federal court. It has to be ticked off by the federal court. Now, all that evidence is there at the moment sitting in these, in these records yep. so the federal court can look at them. Yep. Why aren't we using that? If you want to claim you're Aboriginal and get a benefit or something, why don't you go down to the Native Toll Services and, and say my ancestors Fred blogs for argument's sake and they can prove that or not. But all these governments are too scared to do that. Why? And you know, if, yeah. if we're equal, if we're all equal under the, the law here in this country, and to you, we're all God's children, if I ring up and I'm going to put on a phone call for an insurance company or whatever it is, or a bank, and they'll get question one, hit the button, are you indigenous? Yeah. yeah. What's that got to do with anything? Yeah. Well, so that, that to me creates racism, doesn't it not? Yeah, it does. It divides us again. Look, I always say that we've got to treat things with need. Okay. Okay. All right. Now we've got a we've got a process now in place that identifies the native title owners, right? Yep. yep. So that's in place. Okay. So, but if, if you're looking at health issues, then it should be by needs. If you're looking, if you're lost, look, Australian taxpayers very generous to a large extent. Yep. But there's a limit. You know, if you lost your job, and uh, we're happy to help you to get back into a job. But the second part, we tend to miss out a lot, the getting back into a job part. Yeah, yeah, got and, and now you've got generations of people who are intergenerational unemployment. I can go into some places where they haven't had a job there for three generations. Yeah, terrible. And, of course, what does that do? It destroys people. And I learned that from my own broken arm. I went and had a motorbike accident and I broke my arm and I was off work only for 11 months, right? When a doctor said you can go back to work, it took me three months to get back to work yeah. because I was just sitting around doing nothing. And so uh, a lot, a lot of videos, my mum bloody threatened to kick me out of the house if I didn't get around and do stuff. And this is what happens with you destroy people. In it, I'm a great believer, and look, this is not science, this is just my belief, is that from the cave days, it's in our DNA, you have to do something. You've got to feed your clan. 
You've got to go out and hunt the woolly mammoth. You've got to do things. And you see that when people retire and within a few years they're dead. Mm, that's right. So when you, you know, you're not working, it just destroys you as a human being. As It, it takes away your wills. It takes away your energy. It takes away your ethics and everything. It just breaks it down. And, you, and it's no... Uh, there's no coincidence that when you go into communities where there's large unemployment, no matter who they are, black, white, green, pink or purple, yeah. overseas or here in Australia, you will you will see the breakdown of those social norms. So it's important for us as human beings to actually be doing something. Should we have welcomed the country? Oh, that's driving me mad. Hey, look, what they've done... And did it, did it ever exist? No, it never existed. Because Dingo created it, didn't yeah, he? Was, yeah, it was. It was a, it was a nice idea because you, you see the Maoris coming yeah, well, out, the and the Haka, right. and all that stuff, which is their culture. Yeah, right. That was part of their culture. And that's part of their culture, you know. And our thing was that when you did travel to another country, uh, you know, another tribe or something, then you had to come in and say good day and that but now they've made it they were embarrassed because we didn't have this thing we saw the maoris doing it and we yeah. saw some native americans and that doing it and and you see some in the solomon islands and mm. stuff so they said oh what are we going to do to me and just say go out there and just say good day and you know like we used to do before but now they made it in this massive industry yeah, that's right uh, where you know people get paid a lot of money in fact i think i'm going to start my own business mundine's welcome to country you know, and I can understand when you've got a, a big international event like uh, like Rotary, 4,000 people from the United States and Europe come to Australia. And so you can do a nice ceremony and stuff to welcome. But to be welcomed on a plane, to be uh, every speaker at a conference. I went to a conference several times, and, and I think we spent the first half day doing a welcome to country. And I'm thinking, they're going, mate, I didn't come here for this. I come here to listen to Professor so-and-so or mm. Dr. So-and-so to sprout their knowledge. So it's about time, you know, You know, we, we start pulling back on some of this stuff. You know, like I see it on a plane. If it's so important, I look around the plane, half the, when it lands, half the people couldn't give us stuff. And that then, a good idea, if it's a good idea, then becomes belittled. So let's start getting back to real stuff. Well, what's the language we should use, Warren? Because I'm, I'm a, th- I don't know, third or fourth generation. I'm indigenous to this country. Well, but I so, can't so, say that. I, I, I've got to keep saying, referring to the Aboriginal people as indigenous. And I'm getting, I'm just I don't like the, the word well, indigenous. No, 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 do I? Yeah, I don't. I, I, you know, I was brought up with the word uh, Aboriginal. Indigenous come into the 1990s, and that was because of the United Nations had a conference in Australia, and they called it the International Indigenous Conference education conference and that's where the word started coming from and then oh, all okay. the government departments did it and all that and then it just went wild yep. you know i like the new south wales uh, legislation that here they just because it's um they just call it aboriginals because that's there, there were no torres strait islanders in this an aboriginal country in a sense and you go to the torres straits the torres strait islanders and you talk about torres strait Islanders. but the thing that gets me is I don't like indigenous. I've never liked it. Uh, I like going back to who we are because there was no Aboriginal nation. No, I've never heard of that before. Is it nations? No. Yeah, no. It, it, no that, we, were, we were clans tribes and tribes. tribes. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Like I'm um, Bunjalung, for instance, on my father's side. Uh, that's our tribe. And we have 11 clans within that tribe. And on my mother's side, she's Gumbanga Yuan. And, uh, and I think it's about eight, eight clans within that. I like talking about it, and so I like to identify that. Yep. At the same time, my great grandfather on my mother's side was Irish. Yep. He come out here, married uh, an Aboriginal woman, a Ewan woman from the south coast of New South Wales, and that, which was pretty brave of him because uh, it was in the eighteen sixties, and I don't think marrying an Aboriginal woman would have been, or marrying an Aboriginal man would have been too popular. <laughs> but but he did it, so I'm very proud of him. And, I, and I'm very proud of my Irish ancestry. And I always have a joke when I give a speech where I go, you know, I'm Aboriginal and, and Irish blood, which explains my drinking habit. And uh, and, and it's, it's, it's a lot of fun. I went back. I love the Irish. I went back to Ireland and, and they said to me, they said, what are you doing here? And I said, oh, you know, my great grandfather come from over here. And I was just looking around to see, you know, I was working in London at the time. And I, and I said, I'm going to, I had a couple of days also, I go to, island and just have a look around see where he come from and they said oh and they sort of roll their eyes on oh, another you know american australian or whatever coming here looking for their ancestry and they said okay what was his name and i said well in our family we call it donovan but 
in, uh, but it's Donovan, it's spelled Donovan. And they said, well, here in this county, it's called Donovan. Oh, all right. So I'm thinking, oh, it must, in other counties, it's called Donovan. I said, oh, so I must be in the right place. So we had this conversation. Now, this old bloke was there and he said, shout me a, shout me a beer and uh, I'll tell you all about your Donovans, about your ancestry. Now, I'm sh- we had a great night, but I'm sure 99% of it was bullshit. But it was a great story, and and uh, I loved it. You know, I loved that the way the Irish are about your Irish, and, and and to me, I'm I'm very proud of being Australian. That's my number one thing, and I'm very proud of the Australian nation and every person, every Australian who are here, and people who are coming here in the future, people who will be moving here as well. It's interesting that it really goes back to when we talked about the voice earlier, the control of rhetoric. Yeah. So using language, language using mm. the language which mm. has never been used or or motivating that language in some form. Yeah. And you know it's it's you know it's nice to have place names for things and that as well. Uh but you know I I think people get you know I get sick of people saying we're a racist country. For the last 50 years, 60 years, we have built this incredible we've got rid of all the race laws in this country. Yep. Uh we in fact there's laws that do the opposite, you know, they help aboriginals get to university, help aboriginals in school, help aboriginals get a job and all that type of stuff. You know, so this idea that we're a racist country is just nonsense. Uh, some of my migrant mates say, so, "Oh, we come from a racist country." Wait till you go to, you know, some uh, like Malaysia. If you're Chinese yeah. in Malaysia, you're a second class citizen, yep. or Indian, you're a second class citizen. And I said, "Well, we just can't find that funny when all these people say this is a racist country." It's nonsense, Warren. It's nonsense. As an Aboriginal person or mm-hmm. man, and you interacting with other Aboriginals, are you an outlier or are you reflective of- I know, we have great times. <laughs> but are you reflective of the, what we're talking about today? Yeah. Are we calling it out for what things should be called out for? Well, are yeah. you an outlier or are you, or are you just- No, most Aboriginals, the- uh, most Aboriginals think this way. Now, there's a few myths. They talk about Aboriginal culture and that. Well, most Aboriginals identify as Christian. A lot of people don't know that. It was the last census, Right. We have Aboriginal churches, Aboriginal inland mission and so on. Uh, there's a large Aboriginal Catholic groups. Of course, we have our Aboriginal cultures too. So we have the Aboriginal culture and how we treat each other, how we talk to each other and stuff, as well as the Australian culture and, and how we treat each other and talk about it. So in fact, I think we've got the greatest cultures in the world here, uh, you know, how people get on. We get on 99% of the time. Every now and again, you have a bit of a punch up, but they're outliers. They're people on the fringe. Most Australians get on quite well. I nearly laughed one day. This bloke, I was walking around Sydney University, I think it was, and this young bloke, Sydney University bloke, about 19, well, anyone under 30 is, 40 is young to me now, but he comes up to me and said, look, I would like to, you're an Aboriginal man. And I said, yeah. And he said, I'd like to apologise to you. And I, I'm going, oh, yeah, yeah? Well, what'd you do? You know? And he said, oh, you know, if we come to this country and uh, went on about this. I said, well, if you really feel like that, why don't you... Um, take me to your home and I'll have a look at it and see if I want to move in and you can bugger off from where you come from. You know, I'm sick of this bullshit. Yeah. What are you, you apologising for? Did you go out and murder Aboriginals or did you, did you do this? Did you do? You know, vast majority of Australians, in fact, it's 50% now, more than 50, just over 50% according to the statistics, were never here during the bad times when the wars were going on, the yeah. fights and land and everything yeah. like that. So, you know, this is what migrants are telling me. He said, well, we've only been here 10 minutes. Why are we apologising yeah. for something, you know, or two generations? If you've only been here, say, three generations, then you haven't done anything. And even the fourth generation, mate, uh, most of them didn't do anything either. It was only outliers yeah, that did stuff. And so I think we just need, you know, yeah, sure, you talk about it, you learn about your history, you learn about your country and the great and bad things about your country. No, no country's perfect. But as I was saying earlier is that if you, yeah, I don't rate a country by its bad history, you know, because every country had it. You look at some of these countries in Europe, well, they've, all Asia, been, they've all been invaded, they've all been toppled, they've all been, all been murdered. Yeah, they've all yeah. been colonised and yeah. everything like that. I rate a country by how it overcome yeah. those bad things. And I tell you what, you know, United States, Canada, New Zealand, Australia, Britain, and all these other parts, even in Germany, part of Germany, well, the eastern parts, where they colonised from the Slavs and yeah. stuff. You know, there's a mob of people who come originally from the area around Berlin. They're called Sorbs. Yeah. They're Slavic people. Yep. So the Germans come there. I well, said the Germans apologise and give back Berlin to the Sorbs or something. You know, come on. We need to 
move on and make the world a better place. And you don't make the world a better place by repeating history, by making divisions and fighting amongst each other. Alice Springs, what do we do? Curfew's not going to solve it, surely. No, no, no. Curfew's not going to solve it. But you've got to get control of the streets again. So, so the curfew was fine as a first step. It now needs to take in why it's happening. And so a lot of those kids are coming from the outlying communities. Why are they coming from the outlying com- What's happening in those outlying communities for them to come to Alice Spring to cause problems? That's what they've got to focus on. And, of course, my argument about that, there's no jobs out there. There's no uh, – kids aren't going to school. In fact, one of the things I'm recommending is that through the traditional manhood ceremonies, you make it that they've got to finish school. They've got to go to school and they've got to finish school. In fact, uh, Gondala, who's the clan leader up on, on uh, the islands of uh, North East Island, actually made that suggestion. They've got to finish year 12 to get their manhood ceremony. Because what we're having at the moment, people are you know, 15, 16 going for manhood ceremonies, and then they're going to school and going, you're a female teacher, you can't tell me what to do. It's a problem. It's yeah, a problem. Right. So, and, and it's been identified to me by elders and that this is that it is a problem. And so let, let's say, okay, we're living in the 21st century now. How can we, if you want to continue with those manhood ceremonies, then as culture, and that, then you've got to adjust it to the modern world. A well-known American who was born and raised in Harlem said to someone, if I came here tomorrow night with the construction team and we painted everything, Every building white, cleaned her all up. I guarantee you the next day, if you spray paint graffiti all over the walls, he said it's got nothing to do with the building. The slum or the mentality is in the people. Exactly. Is that right? That is 100% right. Uh, it, it's a, it's about the people and you. And, and it's like what I say about Abri- these remote Aboriginal and regional Aboriginal communities and that is it's your community. You can make the difference. You can ask governments to give build your house and that, but you see the housing and then you come back a month later and it's the plumbing's not working and it's got graffiti and it's got broken windows and that. It's the mentality of you. It's about what you've got pride in. You know, like the first house my parents bought in 1947, it was a tiny little house. It was four rooms, not four bedrooms. You know, mum and dad was in... The, one bedroom, I don't know what they did in there, they never had sex. <laughs> and my sisters were in the other bedroom and then there was the bathroom toilet and there was the um, uh, bathroom laundry, sorry, the toilet was outside, uh, and in the kitchen. Yep. And us boys slept in the veranda, so eight boys, we all slept Serious? in the veranda. And, yeah, right. and that was our home. And then our mum's parents, our grandparents come and st- live with us because they got older, so dad, you know, enclosed the veranda and everything like that. You know, and we thought that was a palace, right? That was a pal- and that's how we treated We kept that house clean. We'd clean every morning. Mum would drag us out of bed. And make, we made our beds. You know, it's like the old military thing. First in the morning, get out of bed and make your bed. And you achieve something. As I said, I used to go to houses where people had their own bedroom. And I thought, gee, these blokes are bloody flash. But at the same time, I was proud of my little house I went back to. That's what you got to do. You, all the little things you do in life and all the little things your parents do for you, you just be happy. Well, then, Warren, can you help me on this, this then? You get a lot of people say to you, you're dealing with a, the Aboriginal peoples who's got a history for 50,000, 60, 70,000 years. Yeah. Okay. And then we're supposed to get them to change all that within 240, 50 years. Hmm. Is that ridiculous or is that actually achievable? So I'm just going back to, you know, it sounds like you've had no issue. You've had to deal with things, but we keep, we always keep hearing it, harking back on, then they can't make the change. Well, is that garbage? Is that true or not? Warren? Well, well, it's, it, it's situations that people find themselves in. Now we're very lucky, you know, you know, I was very lucky. I had the parents and grandparents yeah. and that, that I had who we've got five generations now of home ownership in our family. Right, okay. Going from my grandparents, my parents, myself, my children, and my older siblings' grandchildren have got their own homes. And so, you know, that's five generations. So, to me, there's nothing stopping you from doing that except you. If there are things you can change and the things you can't change. Do the things that you can change. 
that you have power over doing. If Aboriginals around this country have done that, oh, mate, I, I really, I was like a little kid. I was in the toilet once, you know, come out. This is as an adult, and I was, it was at a year 12 seminar, and we were talking to him, and, and uh, Dr. Kong come in, and he's an Aboriginal surgeon, right? And, and he's standing there, and he's going, looking at me, and I'm thinking, oh, this is a bit weird, I'm at the toilet, he's looking at me. And I turned him, and, said, and he said, oh, you're, uh, Warren, I always wanted to meet you. And, and, and I said, oh, you, you're Dr. Kong. I always wanted to meet you too. Wow, you're a surgeon. What an incredible person you are. And he said, and he said, he said, no, no, you're the incredible person. You know, you inspire me. And I just thought that was ridiculous. Yeah. But no matter what you do in life, you'd be surprised about who you inspire. I'm sure that midnight man coming around and collecting the, the pans and that he inspired people to. Warren, even in the, the, the discussion through the voice, the kid coming up, close the gap, close the gap, close the gap, which you've just sort of answered a few points there. Mm. To me, that got bandied around. Everyone used that language nonstop. If I'm in a remote community, how are you ever going to close the gap? You might help me in some regard. You might get me educated, but there's not going to be a Woolworths down the road. There's not going to be a major shopping center. There's not going to be you know, movies, entertainment, et cetera. I've chosen to stay there and that's fine if I wish yeah. to do that. So why do we keep pushing this whole mentality about closing the gap? What does that actually mean? Is it supposed to be closing the gap equal to living in Sydney? Or what does it actually mean? Why? Because some of it seemed to be stretched beyond reason from what I can understand. Yeah, you're 100% right. The first thing we've got to do is stop treating Aboriginals as a whole one homogeneous group. Correct. Look at me. You know, as much as I like the government wanting to buy me a house and, and looking after me, I don't need it. You know, I, I've got a business and, and I've uh, and my kids have got their own businesses and that. We don't need that. Look at all the Aboriginals you see at universities and, and, and working at universities. They don't need it. You know, people like Megan Davis doesn't need that support. She's a professor at law at New South Wales University. Uh, Marcia Langton, she is a professor at Melbourne University. She doesn't need that support. So what we've got to start doing is treating people who need help. Stop with this race. Stop with the treating all Aboriginals the same. And also, when we look at the statistics in regard to Aboriginals living in Sydney and Aboriginals living in, in remote communities, you're looking at two, a different universe. So we've got to stop treating all Aboriginals the same. Okay. We've, got to, we've got to start doing regional approaches. So what, what is in Sydney is going to be less support than what we need for so, someone living out the back of Burke, for argument's sake. And so we need to start making those approaches. The other thing is you, you've got to make tough decisions. Like you look at the Northern Territory. Now, Northern Territory can be another Western Australia in regard to the mining industry, Absolutely. in, in yeah. regard to gas, yep. in, in regard to all these things. It could be a pa and, and both Labor and the country Liberal Party in the Northern Territory are pushing those projects ahead. Yep. But they're being nullified by people in Canberra and people in Sydney, Melbourne and Perth because this is where the Greens are. This is where all the – oh, no, you can't do these projects because it's against Aboriginal culture. Now, you know what? When you fly into these communities, they're saying, we want these jobs. We want this – this mining project to go ahead or this energy project to go ahead or this agricultural project to go ahead, infrastructure and all this type of stuff to happen because especially when you get some of these clan leaders who are the elders who have mm -hmm. been around since the 60s where they had a better education under the mission system yep. and where they've seen, they've, they've travelled around the world because of their art, selling their art and that. They've seen what you can get when you have an economy that's working and, and also they've seen the opposite too, what's happening to their communities in regard to crime rates. You know, what's the old saying? You know, Idle hands is the, uh, you know, the devil's playground. And they've yep. seen this and they want these things to happen so that their communities can become self-sufficient. So that's the first part of that process yep. okay. and to get them educated to do that. Yep. The second part, of course, is that you've got to face, you've got to face the reality that some of these communities are not going to have those projects. No. So we're, so, so yeah. they're going to have to do a couple of things, either yeah. move yeah. or like, well, I'm an economic refugee living in Sydney, as I call myself, because, you know, what the community I come from is only about 200 people. Where's that? Uh, up by Yugal, just out of about 80 kilometres up the Clarence Valley and North Coast. Okay. There's no w way we're going to have a future there. And, and, and so my parents and my cousins, aunties and uncles and that decided to move and they come to Sydney and this is the result of it. Now, 
as a kid from the bush, I didn't like it at first because I loved the freedom of the bush, going out and shooting kangaroos and having a lot of fun. Yep. But um, I look back and I say, no, it was the right decision. And I did it for my kids and now my kids are doing it for their kids and my grandkids. So, And as I say, you know, I've got my, all my sons running their own businesses. You know, they, they employ people, they've got 20 people to 100 people working for them. And they're doing well. And that's because we made that economic decision to move. The other thing is, if you're not going to move, then you've got to be prepared to travel. So that means that if you have fly in and fly out for the mines, you have to get a trade and get into those mines or go to university and get into those mines. And to go to university, you need to travel to university as well. So that's the only two choices. You cannot stay there and just sit there because all you're going to do is just have the continuation of the same old, same old. Mm. Mm. And that's a tough decision. That's against a lot of the rhetoric you hear out there in some of the so-called Aboriginal leadership. But we've got to be realistic and we've got to take a real approach. Are we getting anywhere near that? We are. In the, in the last few years, it's been amazing, uh, a lot of things. One of the things we did in The Voice, and people have done, and it doesn't matter whether they're black, white, or migrants who just got here five minutes ago, they said what you did was, was give us a voice. You actually said things that we believe, but we were too scared to say them because we would have been called racists or sellouts or whatever. But you and Jacinta and, and Karen Little had the bravery to stand up and say, no. This is what we've got to do, and it's what we believe in. And that's one thing I was very proud about Australians across the board, across the races, across the religions, whatever, was that uh, they said, we just want this thing fixed. You know, we just want it fixed, but it's got to be done practically. We've got to have practical outcomes, not these academic things about theories and committees and all this. Next time, you know, every time a politician comes to me and says, oh, look, uh, oh, you're right, Warren, we should form a committee, I say, bugger off. We're not forming a committee. We just want something done. Like, you know, Nigel Scully and jumping in a plane and flying out there and doing something practical on the ground. So what's going on now, Warren? We've we've had the voice. The vote has come in. The decision's been made. But it, I'm getting the impression that was just the beginning. The problem we have now is the states. The states. The states are now pushing this voice. Uh, the Labor states are doing it. And unfortunately... The moderates of the Liberal Party are doing the same thing. Uh, they're pushing. You looked in Queensland where they're setting up a treaty commission and uh, the Liberal Party supported it. 100% the Liberal National Party in Queensland, sorry, supported it 100%. But on whose authority? The country just voted no. Yeah. So what I did, this is where we've got to stand up for what we believe and give voice again. We went up there and had a conversation uh, with the Liberal Nationals. Then the Liberal Nationals said, okay, we were wrong. We saw the vote in Queensland. It was the largest no vote in the country. Uh, so we're, you know, nothing like a vote for a, a politician. And so they said, okay, mate, we agree with you, Warren. So they withdraw their support for the treaty process. And then, of course, that then forced, you know, Palaszczuk, she was leader at the time, forced Palaszczuk to come out and say, if the Liberal National Party are not going to support it, we can't go forward with this. Thank God for that. And now it's party policy. They're running a good campaign up there in Queensland. It looks like they may win the Queensland government at the next election this year, I think it is, uh, by you know a few seats. So that's great. So we've done that. But then you go to South Australia, where, yeah. where Peter Malinak is. Now, look, I know the bloke personally is a really good bloke. Uh, in fact, he had me do the review of adult prisons in reoffending in South Australia. Yep. Did a great review. So, so I have a lot of respect for him. But he's been sold the red pill in regard to the voice. He set up a voice and the Liberals in South Australia supported it. Uh, we had to do a lot of arguments down there in South Australia. Look, you cannot go ahead with this, but he did. But the Liberals now uh, have now pulled their support for it, which is great. And, and look, and look, even Aboriginal, and we were lucky that we were able to look at the voting pattern of the uh, Aboriginal community in South Australia. Only 10% of Aboriginals voted for the voice. 10%, so that means 90% of Aboriginals didn't agree with what Peter Malinakis did. And so we're using that data to push them back to actually get the real practical changes that need to be done. We're also using data from Victoria where they set up their nationalist, the Victorian Indigenous Assembly. Uh, that's uh, only 7% of Aboriginals voted to support that. 7%. So that's 93% 
didn't support this. So now the uh, the Liberal Party's come out and said, no, we're not going to support it. If we get the government, we're going to abandon this. And so finally this is starting to happen and it's pushing back on the Labor and the left agenda of this race divide that is happening and setting up committees and setting up bodies that do not make a single change in people's lives. You saw the recommendations that come out of the, the Victorian Indigenous Assembly where they said, oh, we want land tax to be abolished for Aboriginal people. Mate. To pay lands tax, you have to have ownership of several properties. So you have to be, to own several properties. You have to be doing pretty well. So how many? You know, I, I don't think I oh, no some I'd, hardly any white people who have to pay land tax, let alone Aboriginal people. I'm sitting there going, yeah. well, you know, we're supposed to be the poorest people in the country. How are we going to? You know, this is not going to benefit us. You know, I did a um, Andrew Bolt show and I was going through the reasons why, and then I went, wait a minute. This could help me. I, and I've got properties, <laughs> and so, so I said, "I think I changed my mind." Jokingly said that, but the reality is not going to improve Aboriginal people's lives. It's not going to make a better Victoria. It is not going to make Aboriginals and non-Aboriginals in Victoria come together and build a better, stronger state for everyone. And so we've got to stop doing this stupidity. And so anyway, we, we've got the fight now. There's uh, several groups have been set up to a uh, campaign across the country. Uh, against this now, and, uh, and and the best thing that ever happened to us was having uh, Jacinda Nepajimpa Price and Karen Little elected to the Senate. Yep. Uh, they, they just walked in that Senate as if they were born to it. You ask any Australian, do you any, know anyone in the Senate? And I'll go, ah, uh, uh, Penny Wong, oh, Jacinda Nipper Price and, uh, and Karen Little. And it, Karen Little and Senator Price have only been there since 2022. Yep. Penny Wong's been there for the last 20 years. And so th they've really shaken up that Senate and, and challenged all the, the ideas that have been around for the last 50 years and making improvements. And, and look, I'm very proud of them and I'm a massive supporter of making those changes. So just on that, Warren, you talked about, okay, we're stopping the us versus them mentality, dividing the country. Um, from the Labor side, now the, the Liberal Country Party side, what's the reform agenda which is coming out then from you guys. Well, like, how do you bring the country together, in that, Warren? Well, the first thing we've got to do is actually talk about how proud we are Australians and also how proud we are of all Australians. You know, like I, I talked about migrants. And when I gave a speech throughout the referendum campaign, I said, migrants come to me and I said, I'm really glad you chose our country because look at how hard they work. Some of them come here, they had, had qualifications that weren't recognised. Some here had no qualifications, yep. couldn't even speak English. And they worked in the factories and on the, in, on the farms yep. and really hard. And they worked hard and they did a great job. Their children then become doctors and lawyers and, and finance people and all that type of stuff. And they helped build this country and make it better. Yep. And also they saved me from eating, uh, you know, tomato sauce and Devon sandwiches for the rest of my life. Now I can, <laughs> you know, what right. could be more <laughs> Australian than having a kebab after a night on the turfs? That's your you're right. <laughs> and so, so so, that's the first thing is about we've got to bring ourselves together. I know we're in a very dangerous stage at the moment because of what's happening in the Middle East and there's, yeah. and there's division starting to crack in the country. We've got to bring us back together. We love our Muslims who come here, but you've got to be Australian first. We love our Christians who come here, but you've got to be Australian first. Yeah, we love our, our Sikhs and Hindus and everyone who come here, but you've got to be Australian first. We even love our atheists. And, uh, you know, but you've got to be Australian first. And you've yeah, got to love this country. You think people are proud to even say they're Australian now, Warren? One of the funny things I found is that migrants are more happy to say that than, than Australians who have been here for generations. I really find that a shock because I suppose it, it comes to the fact that they, because they're so recent here, that they know, they come from countries where they're second class citizens. They come from war zones. They come from places where they, you know, like in the Middle East and that, you know, we don't like Christians. We don't like Jews. Uh, we don't like Druze. We don't like uh, Syrians and we don't like them. Uh, and we don't like Muslims who are not our Muslims. So they know what it's like to be treated as second class citizens and treated badly. And they come to Australia because they know everyone's equal. They know there's opportunities galore to, to get to move ahead and make a better life for yourself and the family and that. And, and, and they're actually proud. Look at Di Lee, who went to the parliament and did her maiden speech with and dressed in the Australian flag as yeah. a dress. Yep. She was a, a Vietnamese refugee. 
Uh, how, how wonderful is that? Because she knew that they were, as a Vietnamese Christian, she was uh, driven out by the communist regime out of Vietnam after after they lost. Yep. And they were treated, you know, they were on boats and yep. they were treated horrifically, uh, you know, rapes and everything like that. Yep. Terrible stuff happened to them. Yep. But she, and she's so proud that, and that she's been in Australia that gave her and her family the opportunities to achieve it. Now she's sitting in the federal parliament. What's leadership, Warren? Well, uh, leadership is, is to me is a, a pretty simple thing. Uh, it's it's about uh, it's about you, you got principles you, and you got to be prepared to defend your principles, and you got to stand on them. And that. and so I, I was very lucky in life to have the parents that I had gave me a good work ethic. Five a.m. the alarm clock went off. My dad got out of bed and my mum got out of bed. They had breakfast, washed themselves, and off to work they went. And by that simple task of doing that, that taught me about the simple things in life. If you want to do things in life and improve your life, you got when that alarm gets up, you get out of bed. And you, discipline, very strong discipline, and do the basic thing: a bit of paper sitting on the on the lounge floor. You pick it up and put it in the bin. Uh, you cook your meals. Uh, you clean the house. You know, we used to do a spring cleaning every year. So my brothers and I'd be scrubbing the bathtub and then the ceiling. I, I remember my neck was crook after. I felt like. Michelangelo at one stage in the Sistine Chapel there, you know, washing the ceiling and doing things like that. But it's also to to also be strong and, and live on your principles. And if you don't do that, then you be, you're easily corrupted and you're easily um, not leading. The other thing, you've got to love people. You know, my parents gave me this this love of meeting people. I've never met a person who I haven't learned something from. You know, in a conversation, uh, and I just love meeting people and listening to their stories, and they're listening to my stories, and and, and when you do that, you find that you know, if, if human beings at ten inches, you'll find that nine and a half inches is we're all the same. You know, we love our kids, we love our partners, we go to work, we do things, we get educated. You know, and that other point five inches is different beliefs and different churches or uh, temples and stuff like that and, and food, different food. But when you mix that all up together, you know, look, this is what we did in Australia, you'll have this great, great thing. And so you've got to have that. And also humans, we're all God's children. You've got to treat people with respect and you've got to accept people's different opinions. I always like having a person in the room uh, you know, as much as you know, being the boss, I like to be in charge and telling people what to do. I always like to have some person in the room who will challenge me because you've got to accept that you don't get things right. You could be wrong. Once I, I spent a couple of months working on this project and I turned up there and I got all the staff in and I'm thinking, gee, I'm going to, you know, smash them with this brilliant idea. And I got up there, got my PowerPoint out and da 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 And everyone's going, yeah, yeah, boss, you're doing a great job and clapping and everything like that. And then one bloke, you know, little Johnny down the back of the room puts his hand up and I said, what's, what's the issue, little Johnny? And he said, did you think of this? And I went, ah, oh, no, I didn't. And it didn't work. <laughs> Once you put that in the equation, I said, oh, God, the whole thing I have to redo again. And it's good to have that person in the room. You know, it's good to – and also, even if you do disagree, you know, a lot of people, you know, sit there and go, oh, why, why are you talking to a person who's in a different politics than you? And I said, because I like the person. You know, we go and watch the footy together and have a beer or a soda water or whatever, and we like our meat pie and have a chat and – uh you know, we love each other's kids and the, and the kids come and stay at my place. Then my kids go to their place and stuff like that. And I said, yeah, but they've got a different political viewpoint than you. And I said, so? We live in a democracy, a liberal democracy. People are allowed to have a different viewpoint. But both our different viewpoints is about how do you make the country better. It's not like he's sitting there going, we've got to murder people and burn the country to the ground. You know, we've got different ways of climbing the mountain. I'm on the north face, he's on the left, on the left face or something of the mountain. And you've got to respect that because even with people with different ideas, you learn things from. So taking that just up a gear, for the country, where's the leadership? Uh, unfortunately for the country, it's become about votes. Now, I'm, I'm not a... I'm not stupid to say, you know, you should 
ignore polling and you should uh, not think about votes because to get elected in a democracy, you have to have votes. But what I'm saying is that you also got to have, you got to take your principles with you and you've got to take your love of people and the respect of people with you as well and listen to what they, you know, what their needs and what they want to happen and the issues and problems within their community, the good things in their, in their communities and that. And you've got to keep that in your head. And also at the same time, you've got to be prepared to challenge and take risk. My greatest heroes is, is, you know, come from different sides of politics. You look at Hawke Keating and you look at John Howard and Costello, couldn't get four different people, but they took risk. John Howard standing in front, you know, whether people are, uh, agree with the gun laws or not, he, he actually stood up in front of his constituents who were gun people in there and said, no, we can't do this. We've got to change the gun laws. That's courage. Courage and taking a risk. He could have been voted out and courage to stand up to his own constituents based on his principles. And that's important. And then you had, you know, Bob Hawke with the unions taking on the unions and saying, you have to do this. You can't go and strike all the time. You've got to change the industrial laws, da, 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 da. And, and also the, the, the reforms they had to do in regard to, uh, tariffs and everything like that and open up in our economy and it kept us on the global stage. The regulation. Yeah, yeah. the regulations in it. Yeah. Now, that nearly cost him a prime ministership. In That's fact, right. he was going to be one of the shortest lived prime ministers, you know, within three years, he nearly, he only won by one seat, I think, in yep. his second election. Same with Howard, he only won by in fact, he even lost the vote. It was forty nine fifty one over of the GST, but they had conviction and and belief in the narrative to take us on a journey. Look, I brought my first home. It was eighteen percent. I was paying interest rates, and they and we went through the as Paul Keating said, the recession we had to have. Yeah. But they had this narrative and story to say, look, if we're going to reform the economy, we're going to reform the industrial relations, we're going to reform our competitiveness on the world stage, yeah. then we're going to have to go through some pain. And w we trusted them. Yeah, but at the moment, Warren, what are you seeing in terms of just in those uh, three headlines there? I don't see reform in industrial relations. No. I don't see competitiveness. In fact, we're probably the most unproductive we've been for yep. a long time. Correct. I don't see a vision mm. for this country from both sides enough, to be honest Correct. with you. Now, um, now, this is not a party political thing. It is no. it is just a leadership. It's about leadership. And what about you mentioned Northern Territory? Yeah. What about energy? Yeah, energy, yeah. We're going to drive half the industry out of this country. And it's voodoo. Uh, you know, as uh, I think it was George Bush who said it about Bill Clinton. He said voodoo, voodoo economics. It's the same with we, – we've got voodoo and energy policies now. Like, for instance, if, you, if you're fed income about lower emissions and zero emissions and that, then whether we end up with nuclear power or not, is not the full question. The full question is, why do we ban it? We can't even discuss it. We can't even discuss it. It's, yeah. it's not on the table. It's, it's just bizarre. Yeah. And, well, and then they say, well, it's too expensive. And you say, well, since when did we ban things if they were too expensive? If we ban things because they're too expensive, we wouldn't have mobile phones today. When they first come out, it was bloody expensive. Yep. <laughs> but over a period of time, it goes cheaper. Look, now I'm not going to say nuclear power will get cheaper, but I will say that you don't ban things because you say it's expensive. What you do is you have a proper prosecution of the case from both sides, for and against, and you have a proper scientific debate. There's no science in our debate at the moment. It's all about, you know, again, rah, rah, rah stuff. I work in the renewable industry. I work in the gas industry and I work in the uranium industry. In fact, I sit on a board of an international company that mines uranium. Okay. And, uh, and I just find this conversation about, uh, you know, energy is just insane. And the things that the prices are going through the roof, if renewables and zero emission energy was so cheap, as Chris Bowen says, then why does the government have to spend billions of dollars to subsidise it? Yeah. The only thing we've created at the moment is higher energy prices and a very rich class of people who are living off government sub sub subsidies. You're ex ALP. Mm. Yes. So you a bit like Reagan, are you? Oh, yeah. I did, the, you know, I didn't leave the party. The party left me. Is that is that where it's at in yeah. that sense? Uh, I'm better looking, but it's um. <laughs> 
uh, someone actually asked me this question on radio a couple of years ago. They said yeah. to me, they said, well, what's your, you know, you're in ALP, now you're in the Liberal Party, what's your politics now? And I said, I'm still that Hawke Keating man. I'm about reform. For the country. For the country. You've got to keep on reforming. Uh, you know, once you reform something, it doesn't stop because global economy changes, global issues change. Look, who would have predicted the collapse of the Soviet Union back in the 80s? Yeah. Uh, that changed everything. Then now all of a sudden, uh, look at China, the rise of China, that's changed the international stage and everything. So things change. So you've got to keep reform on the agenda. And the biggest one of all, you've got to keep agile. And how do you keep agile? It's like having a good half back in rugby league. Is that you've got to you've got to have productivity as the forefront of that. So people are getting a good wage for production, and we've got to be agile for that. So we've got to keep at the forefront of technology. We've got to keep at the forefront of that productivity in regard to our working arrangements. You know, there is nothing sacrosanct in this, except that we've got to ensure that people are getting jobs and working and they're on the right track, and we're able, no matter what happens on the global stage, we're able to be agile enough to compete. Yeah, okay. You know what you said earlier, we talked about the larrikinism of Australia. Yes. Okay. And when, when I, I remember having those tomato sauce Devon sandwiches every day as well, <laughs> and, and they're all soggy when I opened them up under them in the glad <laughs> wrap, right. right? Shocker. The, and the and, worst and, when they put tomato <laughs> on it, too. That, <laughs> right. that made it worse. That's yeah. right. And you had your apple with you, and you're really lucky, right? <laughs> yeah. But it was very interesting in those days. There was a get up and go. Yes. I should not necessarily should be right, mate. I'll have a crack. Yeah, it was part of the DNA of Australia. Yeah. We, I don't see. I have a crack. I'll have a whinge. I'll have a complaint. Yep. Yep. I'll have an excuse. And maybe I'm being a bit too harsh here. Yep. You know, you're talking about earlier in about the Aboriginal yeah. society and the peoples, but also a lot of Australians have slipped this way as well. Yes, yes, so, they have. And we're supporting it from a government mentality. On you know, look at a government and what they're supporting in coming back to work. No, you yeah. don't have to if you work for. Yeah. Public sector. I mean, that's setting the wrong tone as well, is it not? Yeah. Well, the public sector is growing. It's, it's massive now, the public sector. Uh, but where does the money come from for the public sector? It comes from me. It comes from, from us Tax. workers, taxpayers. Yeah. Now. In looking at Victoria, and it's coming home to haunt Victoria at the moment, they had a printing press down there. They are bankrupt. And guess what they're doing now? They said they ban gas, and guess where they're getting their energy from? They're getting it from us, yeah. from New South Wales, Queensland, and other places. Cold and gas. And you're looking at South Australia, the same thing. Yep. They're doing it. So they're living off us. The problem they have is that the printing press is going to break down. It's going to yeah. run out of ink soon. And it's, it, well, it has run out well, of ink. Well, it's also draining on the rest of the states as it's, well, right? And, and, and the problem with that is that when they have to make the decisions to get real, it's going to be worse than my 18% interest rate because we're in a better position in the – 80s yep. uh, than what we are today to actually absorb that pain. I'm afraid that you know, Victoria and, and places like that are going to go through a very, very painful exercise. All right, Warren. People are going to lose their jobs, yep. and especially the public service, because you're going to have to reduce the public service. It's going to be like a uh, Campbell Newman approach where they had to just thousands of people just got lost their jobs yep. and, and it's going to be a very painful thing. So we have to start, you know, we have to start getting realistic. Otherwise, you know, I was, I was talking with Tony Shepard the other day. Oh, yeah. he, he's a good mate of mine. Uh, we're going to catch up and have a beer and a, hopefully a meat pie next week. And, and we're going to talk through some of these issues. And the business community also has to get on the right track. This was about to ask you, you're up against Corporate Australia and The Voice. Yeah. Where's Corporate Australia in Australia? This is the problem. The large corporations are now uh, starting to wake up. So look at some of the things that were said at the last elections. The Small Business Association, which is our biggest employer, yep. small businesses. Yeah, it is. And especially in regional and remote Australia, they yep. are the businesses. Yep. They come out in support of the government, the current government, I mean, which is the opposition at the time, in regard to the industrial relations stuff. Well, guess who's whinging and complaining the most today? Yeah. Mate, they got to stop doing that. They've got to stop uh, this partisan politics or this wokeness that's going on and actually start saying, no, we're about our business and our shareholders and the Australian people. That's what we're about. And if we don't do these things, our shareholders are going to lose their money, we're going to lose our business, and the Australian people are going to suffer. Now, Tony was on the 2GB today. Yep. And talking and that, but he's very 
being polite. In fact, I put the rung him up and said, mate, you've been a bit too polite there. Yeah. We need some business leaders that we had in those 70s and 80s and yeah. 90s who took up the challenge. But did they get a voice, Warren? You know, no, from what I've heard from the last couple of prime ministers, and this is, you know better yeah. than I will, mm. almost impossible to get in front of them. Yep. All right. If you do it, everything's got to be done very, very quietly, which I understand. Yeah. But th they've given up half the time as well, saying every time I push a case, there's going to be maybe some pain given back later by the party. Well, they've got to take the pain. Otherwise, if we don't, uh, then most Australians are going to suffer. Look at the housing stuff. Yeah. You know, you know, criminal. W when I was a kid, and probably like you too, yep. uh, is that the first thing we thought about was b when we left school was buy a home. Yeah, but it wasn't going to cost me seven hundred thousand yeah, dollars right. for my proof. Well, yeah, I talk to kids today, and they they've sort of said, "Well, why should we save? Why we should may as well go on a holiday to Hawaii or something, or Bali or something like that? Because there's no way we're going to get a house. Well, we've got to fix that." We're one of the leading countries in the world of home ownership. If our people into the future cannot buy a home, then we, you may as well kiss everything goodbye. Kiss it goodbye. And that's why businesses started got to stand up now and take up the, the cudgel to the government. And I'm saying this, as even though I'm in the Liberal Party, I'm saying they've got to take it to the Liberal Party, they've got to take it to the National Party, they've got to take it up against the Labor Party, and for God's sake, they've got to flog the Greens. And if they don't do that, then we're in big trouble. Wokeism? Uh, I'm, I'm glad to see it starting to turn around at the moment yep. uh, because I've never seen a more divisive, disgraceful thing. You know, people being banned because they got the wrong, you know, pronouns. In fact, when someone said, what's your pronouns? I had to look it up in the dictionary. I didn't know what it was. You know, I just, it's just bizarre, you know, and this non-scientific approach to everything. It's just crazy. It's about feelings, you know? Mate, we, if, if, if our troops on Gallipoli yep. talked about feelings all the time, we would have been massacred in bull court and, 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 Bob, and, you go first and all that. I was old enough to know at the end of their life some people who served in the First World War. Yeah, okay. And I knew Second World War people in Korean and, and Confrontasi in Vietnam and that. And these people were my heroes because you could, can you imagine people in the First World War, right, in the Second World War? It wasn't about drones or bomb. It, they actually looked in the eyes of the person they had to kill. Yep. And, you know, and when you're growing up, you're taught not to hurt anyone, you're taught not to kill anyone, and all of a sudden you're in a situation where you have to do these things. These were the greatest people. No wonder the Americans call it the greatest generations because they went through all that hell come back and got on with the job of building the nation. That's the type of stoic, strong stuff we need today. Okay. So what have you heard about building the nation from our government? Well, it's building the nation. <laughs> Mate, it's so just we're, about, so in other words, it, we're just losing just, time. We've just lost 10 years. We're going to lose another. Well, they're just tossing money, you know. One of the things I say, like, you know, like when you look at the $4 billion they gave out, uh, in regard to to the housing stuff for Aboriginal people. In the oh, so what was that about? It's not going to do a thing. You know no. why? We've got to do a deal with the Aboriginal communities. Some of those Aboriginal communities, because they'd got mining agreements, okay. they've got $600 million in the bank. So why can't we work with them? Why shouldn't the tax and say, okay, we'll give you, you got, say, you're not going to spend this whole 600 million. You've got to do, say, you give us 200 million yep. and we'll get 200 million in and we'll help build houses that you can own and start moving from there. And also then we look at access to education. Yep. You know, you know, uh, you're not going to have a high school in a remote community because you don't get the smorgasbord of studies that you need to have. Yeah. Or the teachers and teachers, else, right? all that, right. You know, you end up with what teacher you can get. You know, yeah. you want a maths teacher, you can probably end up with a physical education teacher yeah. or something like that yep. or, or vice versa. Yep. And so, so what we've got to do is about how we can, we used to have school of the air. Well, how about get boarding stuff done, you know? So, that, so rather than flying to, Melbourne or Sydney, which they can do, uh, they can go to Alice Springs from those communities and get educated there. And we set up a proper high school system where they get that smorgasbord of teachers who are qualified in those. That's the other thing. Yeah, I'm glad you brought up maths teachers and that. We are losing maths and science teachers. And what is the world's future? STEM. Yeah. 
for God's sake, why aren't we putting money in the rounding up those type of teachers? Instead of talking about going against the science of biology and talking about, you know, 40, 50 genders. My thing is, why don't we just treat people as human beings, as God's children, and just do that and start talking about the STEM that we have to be competitive against China, against uh, Russia or against Southeast Asia and all be a contributor to those countries and they can be a contributor to us. Now, our next door neighbour is Indonesia. It's not going to pack up and move away. Uh, We should be 100% working with them on their minerals and, and exports that they can produce and providing stuff to them that we produce and also have an exchange. Go back to the old Colombo plan. Yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. go back with, where they have students and people coming here. We have students and people going there. So we get to know each other better. Because one of the things in the world is that, you know, when you have democracies and that, and, and Indonesia is a, a democracy, but it's not perfect. It's still got a way to go to get to our standard. Yep. But we can help them get that far and we can work with them and be their friends rather than having these silly arguments every so often, you know? Hard to be friends, um, Warren, when we change every three years. Do you think that needs to be seriously looked at as a reform agenda for federal politics? I'm a bit (laughs) uh, laughing because I'm a bit challenged about it. I've always been a a four-year term person, but after watching what happened in New South Wales, we had a premier every, uh, every, uh, almost every month. It was, in fact, uh, we used to laugh about Italy having a prime minister every, every year. They, They started laughing at us because we were having a change of premier every so often. Uh, look, I'm happy with that stretch out, but also having that you, you're not forced to have that government for the four years. So if something doesn't work, they, the parliament can change it and stuff like that. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I'm not. Just three years seems so short these days, Warren. It, it, well, they don't do three years, really. They, they pick and choose every two years or whatever, whenever they like. I like that set term three to four years. I know in Britain they do five years. Yeah. I think five years is too long. Uh, and then you've got to think about the Senate. You know, the Senate, uh, you don't want the situation like you have in New South Wales. I went to four years. You get elected to the House of uh, the Legislative Council. Yep. You're there for eight years, mate. Come on, you know. By the time you get down the track four years, society, things have changed, global economies changed, things like that. So, you know, I reckon the upper house and the lower house should go at the same time. Yep. Make it four years. Get it yeah. refreshed. Get it refreshed. Yep. Hmm. Where's Australia on the world stage now? So we've had some interesting commentary come out in the last couple of weeks with our views on the Middle East, our relationships with the Middle East, our partnership with the US, partnership with the UK. And where do we stand, Warren? We're all over the place. We're like a drunken sailor who just got into port. Look, I I call this Obamaism. I'm going to bring his name. You know, I know everyone loves him and all that type of stuff. But his international uh, policy was just crap. Uh, he, all the allies we had, okay, some of them weren't nice people, but I think it was Eisenhower said they may be a son of a bitch, but they're our son of a bitch. And what happened? We ended up with people who were worse. And so, and then we had to have a, a counter coup in Egypt to get back to be our allies again. And so we got, look, we've got to be realistic about our approach. Israel is, in t- talking about the Middle East, is a liberal democracy. The lies that are told about Israel is incredible. You know, like they say, you know, it's an apartheid, Satan, all this stuff. I've been to Israel. You know, nine million people live in Israel. Two million of them are Palestinians, Arabs. They serve in the Israeli army. They serve in the Israeli police force. They serve in the in the parliament. They get elected to the Knesset, as they call it. Uh, they got high court judges, Supreme Court judges. They are farmers. They are in the economy. They are part of the economy. Plus, you have Bedouins. Uh, they are in the police with exactly the same, plus you have Druze, exactly the same, and then, of course, you've got the Jews and the Christians, exactly the same. And so uh, this idea is just nonsense. It's, it's the most multicultural, multi-ethnic, multi-faith country in the Middle East. You look at other countries and that, and you go to Iraq and Syria, the Christian populations have been driven out of those places. Absolutely. I mean, it's slaughtered in it's some slaughtered. places. It's yeah. slaughtered. And the Jewish population, you know, Damascus used to be, back in 1940, I think it was about 30% Jewish. Yep. 
you'd be lucky to see a Jew that lives there that day. Yeah. So we've got to stick by countries like us that are free, liberal democracies, multicultural, multiracial, and the rule of law. It rules. So, you, you know, in Israel, in fact, there's been a prime minister and a president who have gone to jail because they broke the rule. Could you imagine that in uh, Iran? There is no way a president in Iran or the prime minister in Iran is going to go to jail because of the rule of law. They are the rule of law. Yeah. And so we, we've got to support Israel 100%. Look at the, it's It's got neighbors around it who hate it. Yep. But one thing I have a lot of confidence in now is how the Saudi Arabians and the Jordanians stood up against Iran yeah. uh, in when they shot the missiles at uh, Israel. They yeah. actually sent their airplanes out to shoot them down. Yeah. So even the Arab, look at the Abraham Accord. Well, the Egyptians are supporting Yeah, with the too. Moroccos, Egypt. Yep. Emirates, United Emirates, all signed peace treaties with Israel. Yep. Uh, we need to get Lebanon involved in that process, but it's going to be difficult because of Hezbollah in the south, Yep. Uh, which is a Iranian proxy, and we've got to sort out the, the two-state solution with the Palestinians. But the Palestinians have to come to the table. They have to get rid of all these Iranian subsidiary groups, yep. such as Hamas. Ham- Hamas is, since the 7th of October, what they did on the 7th of October is just horrific and horrendous crimes, yep. and they have now dealt themselves out of sitting at the peace table. They must be annihilated. I'll, I'll say, say that quite publicly. I've said it publicly before. They have to be annihilated, and there has to be a new uh, Palestinian government. So, but we're, we're giving pretty mixed messages about our support oh, Well, there. that's right. Well, this is yeah. the thing about Penny Wong that really disgusted me. But hold on, hold on. But in whose imprimatur was that? Was that Penny Wong going with it, or was that... Under support of the prime minister as well. Well, it was support of the prime the prime minister. It, it's Albanese government, right? Yeah. What they were trying to do because they looked at the polling and we've seen similar polling uh, that oh, okay. uh, these seats uh, again government by polling and not policy by polling. You can't do that, uh, especially in these principal issues. You know that they saw the polling that they could lose some seats in Western Sydney, uh, and because of that Muslim vote. And so, look, I have confidence. This we've got to stick to your principles and believe in people. When in in the uh, last Victorian election, uh, where uh, Dan Andrews returned, we did a trial of going out and meeting with people in Western Melbourne and talking to them about the principles of what we hold and what the principles of the Liberal Party were. We got it's the only part in the state that we had swings to the coalition. Nine percent was the smallest. Eleven percent was the highest. We went to the mosque and talked to the Muslims about it. And guess what? We got 20 volunteers out of some of those mosques. Yeah, right. So I have faith. And some people may say I'm naive, but I'm not naive. I'm very realistic in that. You've got to talk to people. You can't ignore them. So we went there and challenged people who were listening to Iran and other places. And, yeah. and the vast majority of people listened to us. And we had really good conversations and that's where we got our volunteers from we've got to continually do that and make them become aussies now uh, because of the religious beliefs you know some of them may snigger alcohol now and again but you know as long as they enjoy a meat to pie and a footy and and call each other names like we call each other names and have that larrikin approach that's fine with me and that's what we've got to do and that's what i want to do you know leading up the next federal election in going out into western sydney and talking to them because if you don't talk to them then they get easily brainwashed by other people who are you representing in the next federal election or like what when you say that you're going to go start talking the next federal election we got well maybe first question is if you look at all the states warren liberals have been slaughtered yep so they're miles behind what's going on there well, that's because they lost their base. They they started doing what the Labor Party started doing, and that's looking at polling. Is that's that, what, it comes, is that what you reckon it comes down to? Well, what it comes down to is that they are listening to the wokes. They've gone woke. You know, you look at – look. I love these people. They're good people, decent people and that. But, you know, you look at the Liberal leaders in New South Wales. Yep. They didn't get up and stand up for stuff. You know, And one of the things I don't like is people who take you for a fool and lie to you. And this is what some of them did. You look at the leadership in Victoria, the leadership in Victoria of the Liberals is a joke. Yeah, I agree. Unfortunately, it's looking like they won't even win the next Victorian election because even though the people are looking for someone to vote for because they're sick and tired of the Labor Party's just, uh, you know, just 
are sending them broke. You know, businesses are leaving Victoria and everything like that. Uh, look, I'm <laughs> I was laughing because I know what I'm going to do. Uh, what are you going to do? We're going to fight this. We're going to, within the, the Liberal Party, within the coalition, and we're going to and we're going to stand up for principles. And the principles of the Liberal Party, are, you know, Menzies laid them out. It's about small business. It's about industrial relations. It's it's about productivity. It's about owning your own home. It's about how you get the education system working. It's about equalities and freedoms and law enforcement and equal before the law. It's about all those principles. Uh, you know, you can believe and you can eat whatever you want, dress whatever you want to like about. Uh, but, you know, you've got to treat other people decently and you've got to treat people equal. What's going to happen in the States, Warren? We've got the big election coming Well, out. you know, I, I'd say it looks like Trump will win. But, gee, what's happened to America where it talk to my American friends and mm. that, and I say, what happened to 40-year-olds and 50-year-olds in the United States? We're having elections where my grandfather, who's now passed away, uh, was younger than these blokes running for president. What's happened to America? America has really lost its way. But again, I think John Howard is right. We've got a Westminster system like this, so you just can't have a person who can bypass the Congress and become president and the party, while in, uh, in America you can do that. Warren, just finishing up, as a, as a young man growing up, how tough is it when you're coming from an Aboriginal background? What's the message you want to pass out to the other young kids coming through now? A prime minister said once, a famous prime minister, said life was not meant to be easy. Yeah, yeah, remember that one? Yep. yep. And uh, you've got to be agile and you've got to be stoic. So what are you, one of what, Warren? One of how many kids? I'm um, one of 11 kids. Uh, my parents, they told me uh, that, and if you believe this, <laughs> you believe anything. <laughs> my parents told me they tried eight times and it didn't work. And then the ninth trial come along, which was me, and they said, oh, this is perfect. So we'll have two more goes and it didn't work again. So my brothers and sisters were jealous of me because I was the only one who had brains and good looks. But no, it was a great childhood. We were poor. But one thing about childhood, kids, they make life what it is, what you got. Whatever yep. life's thrown at you, you make it. So if, if you can't afford to buy a, a plastic car or something or a metal car or something like that, then you get a bit of wood and you drive around with it and you have fun. And uh, and this is what kids are like. I, you know, and that's why people say to me, you're like a kid. And, that, and I, you're going through your second childhood. And I said, no, I haven't got out of my first. Is that, is that I say to kids, the world's got so many opportunities. In Australia, even under a tough time, mm. you give, you've still got hundreds of thousands of opportunities to do things. So I, I, and you're, it's like sitting at a bus stop. The 407 turns up and you go, oh, I'm not too sure about that one. And then the 4010 turns up and you think, oh, yeah, maybe I'll jump on this bus or something like that. And it's about getting a good, solid grounding education that will give you the agility to choose which bus you get on. Mum and dad believe in education? Mum and dad had very limited education because they come from the bush out in the communities. But uh, they, they said you're either working or you're educated, or both. And that was their strong thing. You had to get to school. In fact, my brothers and I had got certificates of, uh, of attendance more than we got certificates of being smart. But education is, is so important. And education is not only about what you're learning at school. It's what you're learning from other people. It's what you're learning when you're reading a book at home and watching a movie. It's what you're learning uh, when you, you're traveling around and observing and that, you know, life's experience. In fact, I always get my education, toss it in a cooking pot with my life experiences, with people I've met in my journey in life, what's worked, what hasn't worked, and mix that up and cook it. And that's what I, that's how I come up with ideas. Yeah, and well, I heard you once at a speech say the big turning point was your first job. I was so excited about my first job. Look, what happened was I, I went out to Silverwater in Auburn, which is a large industrial area. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I went from factory to factory, knocked on the door and said, you know, you got a job, got an apprenticeship or something like that. And I did this up and down the street. And then I got, went to this next street, the third street, actually, it was. And this bloke, you know, because they must, oh, this is over a couple of days. They must have been talking to each other. And 
And I knocked on the door and this, and this bloke comes out. And I said, look, you know, got a job. And he said, oh, you're that Aboriginal bloke that people have been talking about. And I said, huh? And they said, yeah, they said the other street and you'd be knocking up and down the road looking for a job. And he said, he said that'll do me. He said, uh, I'll give you a job. And I said, okay. And he, I was a trolley boy, so when the trucks come in, I they loaded the, you know, all the boxes and everything on the trucks and the steel pipes and everything. They took them down to the warehouse and loaded it up. And then after Christmas, I was working there a couple of months, he said, I'll give you an apprenticeship. So I did a fitter and turner and, and I went from there. And never give up and, and don't get despaired because it's like asking for a date. The first one knocks you back, that's okay. There's a lot of women out there who may want to dance with you. Did you set out on a big agenda, Warren, or was it, is it just, you know, just take it on my stride as I go? Or what, like, you mean, think about where you, where you started and now where you are now and, and the influence that you've had. Yeah. Well, I was sort of, when I went back to a class reunion only a couple of months ago and, and people said, oh yeah, they, oh, everyone knew me and everything like that. And they said, oh, you know, you, you know, it's great. We, cause we all come, a lot of us doesn't matter black or white or migrants or whatever, we we come from poor backgrounds and that. And they said, oh, you, you've done well and everything like that. And I said, well, you've done well. You're enjoying life. You know, my dad had this little thing about p- people. You know, you could be the, the midnight man, you know, the old toilet bloke who's yeah, yeah. come around. Yep. Or you could be a doctor who respected you both. You worked. You were working and you were trying to feed your family and try and look after yourself and, and you're providing a service. I tell you, if you didn't have a midnight man, then you, where were you going to do a poop? And doctor, you know, if you get sick and stuff like that. So you know, everyone has an important role to play, and uh, and you got to re- you got to respect them like that. And so to me, it was like actually this is the second time I got asked that question. Yeah. Uh, this last time was this year ten kid asked me that, and it was the first time it happened. And I thought he said, you know, what was your plan? How you were going to do things and that. And I thought to myself, there wasn't a bloody plan. All all I it was sort of like how I got my wife. Was you know I was uh, staying overnight at the house and and her sister and her were living together and that and her sister come down and I walked downstairs and I saw the saw the heater and it was broken so I went and got a, a knife you know the old cheap screwdriver and and did a bit of work on it <laughs> and then they and then her, her sister sang out and said this but you got to keep you can fix things and and that's sort of what it was I used to. Um, I see something that was broken and I said, oh yeah, I can fix that and have a go at it. And, and that's all I did. If you're going to look back at that young bloke, Warren, finishing school in Sydney, and as you say, going forward, what advice would you give young Warren today? Ah, oh, gee, I'd give him a lot of advice, probably useless stuff. My thing was, is life is great. Enjoy life. Life is a lot of fun. Don't despair. And sometimes the best things in life, you get a bit of skin knocked off you. Like I used to play soccer and rugby league and I loved it, but you got a bit of skin knocked off you. And uh, so don't worry about that. Just get up, whack a band-aid on or whatever you've got to do and, and have another go. But don't worry about knockers. You're the only one who can live your life and no one else can. Governments can't fix your life. Doctors can't even fix your life. They might fix your broken leg, but if you're not going to do the therapy and the physio and that, then you're not going to get better. Uh, you're the one who's got to get out there and do things and that. So, and that, and look, any, there's a lot of knockers in the world. D- don't worry about knockers. Just do your thing. Do what you believe in. Because I, I see some people that get knocked and, and, uh, but they've pushed their way through it and they've done great things. And I see other people who, who, are, who could do great things and, and they let the knockers get to them. No, it's you. You're the only one who can make your life better. On that, Warren, thank you very much for joining us today. Okay, thank you. You've been listening to No Limitations. <laughs>